big hello to everyone. Um, for those of you that still don't know me, my name's Alex. So I'm 16 and I'm working on, in quantum computing for finance. And when I say finance is one of quantum computing's largest applications, I really mean it. Everything that we do in finance can benefit from some of the exponential speed ups that quantum computing provides. So you can think, oh. <laughs> uh, you can think of this um, from everything from Monte Carlo integrations to options pricing to value at risk to credit risk. Everything can be evaluated using quantum systems. But before we get into some of the main components of quantum and finance, I wanted to give everyone a quick recap of quantum computing. So quantum computing is a bit like Kanye West, whether you like it or not. Um, with Kanye, you never know what, what's gonna happen next. He might go on a tweet storm, he might not. He might show up at a show, or he might not. Um, I feel bad for the people that bought tickets, but. Um, quantum computing is essentially the same thing. It's in a superposition of two states at once. And this is actually good un for, un unlike Kanye concert ticket holders, um, this state of uncertainty is helpful to us because we're able to load more information on a single qubit than we could uh, with a classical bit. And what do I mean by that? So with 30 qubits, you could hold the same amount of bits that are on your average CD, Yeezus for example. Um, on 40 qubits, you scale that up to the storage of an iPhone. But on just 256 qubits, you can take that to more atoms than there are in the visible universe. So more bits, then there are atoms in the observable universe. Let me just, just like make sure you understand that. That's an immense amount of uh, processing power. And so why might this be useful to us? Well, first of all, we can simulate natural systems. So everything from tsunamis to hurricanes uh, to other natural uh, disasters, we can better predict them and help people uh, get out and know how to aid them when we need to build back better. Um, also, molecules. We can, uh, we can speed up drug discovery uh, because of the complex uh, quantum mechanical interactions that take place between molecules and atoms, we can model them better on a quantum computer. But also, something that may not seem as intuitive are financial markets. Uh, financial markets do evolve like natural systems despite what you may think. Um, and this is due to Brownian motion. So all Brownian motion is is this random walk up and down uh, in these little squiggles that you can see here. And then that's what it essentially is. And this is exactly how a natural weather pattern would occur. So th all this means is that we can model financial systems as natural physical systems. So there are a variety of different uh, ways we could take this presentation, but for our, pers our purposes today, I wanted to focus in on portfolio optimization. So for those of you who aren't familiar, for all portfolio optimization is, is given a basket of stocks, which ones do I invest in to maximize my profits? my return on investment. So if I'm given, say, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, in which, in which ones do I invest, and in which ones do I not invest to maximize my profits? Pretty simple concept, like make the most money. <laughs> and what we can do here um, is model this, system, this natural system as a Hamiltonian. Obviously Kim's not here, which is kind of sad, but um, obviously the Hamilton reference. And all this equation is encapsulating is the evolution of the physical system over time. And so within these four, um, four terms, we can know everything about the evolution of the natural system for an infinite interval of time, which is really cool when you think about it because this little thing can predict the universe, essentially. Um, and what's really cool about the Hamiltonian is that, can it, that it can be modeled as a matrix. Um, so obviously for, you, for those of you familiar with AI, this would seem kind of uh, intuitive. All of these entries are just numbers, and these numbers, what they do when applied to a vector space is that they change this vector space. So when this transformation is applied, vectors in a vector space are fundamentally changed. So you can imagine if this green vector V was initially on the x-axis or the y-axis, after a matrix transformation, this vector is now on a 45 degree angle. The span of this vector is also an important concept to know. It's, all it is is essentially this gray line that spans out the back and out the front. Essentially spanning, span, pretty easy to remember. And so there exists a special subset of vectors that when applied to this matrix do not change the direction of the vector. They keep the, they keep the direction the same. All they do is scale this. So you can see it's like multiplying by two or multiplying by one half or multiplying by negative one. And we call these special vectors eigenvectors. 
and the scalar values that they're equal to multiplying by as eigenvalues. And why might this be important for our application? They're in fact the solution to our problem. So the lowest possible eigenvalue that we can get out of this matrix here is the solution to our problem, which in this case is an optimal portfolio. So another intuitive way to look at things is at the energy graph of the Hamiltonian. So we have the progression of the Hamiltonian over time, and we have a global minimum at x equals zero. So the lowest eigenvalue of the system is at x equals zero, and that's the solution to our system. We also call this solution the ground state because all physical systems, they want to move to their lowest energy point. And what we're trying to do is find the slowest eigenvalue, i.e. the ground state. So how would we go about finding this uh, solution? So we use, uh, there are a variety of methods in quantum computing to find the slowest possible eigenvalue and ground state. But for our purposes today, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, variational quantum eigensolver. So quantum as in quantum computing and eigensolver as in solving for the eigenvalues. But what is variational? Variational is taking advantage of the variational method of quantum mechanics, which states that any of our guesses for the lowest possible eigenvalues always have to be greater than or equal to the minimum eigenvalue. So here, um, intuitively, it makes sense. If I guess, for example, at 3, um, I'm, all, I'm above my minimum eigenvalue at 0, but if I guess at 0, then I'm at that eigenvalue and I found my solution. So no matter what, it restricts your set of guesses to a very particular space. So what is the process that we want to follow? Oh, there you go. Um, I wanted to underline that DQE is a hybrid routine, meaning that we use both classical and quantum components within our uh, routine. So we create an arbitrary quantum state, so you can imagine this as a, some sort of superposition, but it's parameterized, parameterized by this value theta. And all this value theta is is a classical component that can be optimized. So for those of you familiar with AI, this is almost like SAS gradient descent to where we keep changing this until we reach our lowest eigenvalue. So step one is to take a good guess, which we call our onslaughts. So we have a variety of factors that may um, influence our first guess based on uh, the variational method as well as other solutions that we found classically. Uh, once we've taken this guess, we then move on to uh, move on to loading the Hamiltonian into uh, onto our quantum computer. This is called state preparation. And all we do to load this Hamiltonian onto our quantum computer is to apply a bunch of rotational gates that encapsulate the Hamiltonian and therefore the evolution of the system. Next, we want to run the quantum circuit with our parameters. So we let the circuit run to let all the gates through. And then we measure the expectation value. Now measurement is of course in quantum mechanics probabilistic, so we need to do a bunch of measurements to make sure we get an accurate result, and that's essentially what the expectation value encapsulates. And five, we need to optimize classically. So we send our result from the quantum computer to a classical computer, it uses a classical optimizer to make a, an updated guess on where that lowest eigenvalue may be, and it sends it back to the quantum computer to repeat until convergence. And convergence is, in this case is a good enough guess to our lowest possible eigenvalue, uh, to where our solution is satisfied. So let's take a look uh, at a practical example. So here I have the basket of four stocks. I have Amazon, SPY, which is the S&P 500 index. I have uh, Boeing and I have Chevron. And we have a, a 10 year span of their performance. So given this basket of stocks, which one should I invest in and not invest in to maximize my return? So I put the, these values into my VQE and it spits out something like this. So it spits out the optimal function value, that's the lowest possible eigenstate that we were looking for on that graph, and an optimal value. So it tells me 1, 1, 2, 0. And all this corresponds to is a 25% allocation in Amazon, a 25% allocation in the S&P 500, and a 50% allocation in Boeing. And status is success. Does it work? Um, and what we're doing with VQEs is we're taking classical processes that would have taken banks days to solve to just mid, uh, seconds or minutes to, to the point where uh, the information we're getting out of these models is actually relevant and we can make actionable decisions. And in the long term, what this will do is allow banks to make better portfolio optimization decisions, which in turn will allow consumers to get better returns on their portfolios, making you money. Thank you.